Welcome to Fair Park Community Baptist Church this second Sunday in December. We are so glad you are here. Uh, our Advent is moving along rapidly. We're going to ask Becky to come and read for us and greet us with our uh, uh, time of, uh, of Advent. And uh, we will have our candle lit at the same time. We'll see if we can do two things at once. <laughs> All right, Becky, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. The third Sunday of Advent, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they, were, when they came into the house, they saw a young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when he, they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and mirth. Joy is a word of emotion and feeling. It moves our heart to bubble over. We feel excited and comforted. We feel happy and full of elation. Great joy can be interpreted overjoyed. That is a good way to think of the wise men as they found the place where Jesus abode. For all the joy in the world cannot contain the joy of meeting Jesus. Surely every day as we arise and our devotions are offered heavenward, joy should fill our soul. It's an honor to be in the presence of our Savior, Lord and King, to think he, be he came because of you and me. To contemplate the glory of his presence, what a joy. As Christmas approaches, don't become bogged down and the worries that befall you. Remember the reason for the season. May your heart overflow with joy. See, when things are changed a little bit, I get all messed up. I forgot to have Al play his prelude, so we're going to listen to Brother Al. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad you're here with me. I need your support lots. So uh, I want to bring the sunshine in here and let the Lord know that we're here to praise him. So let's all stand and sing our first song. How?
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh God, in your house we have come and communed together, remembering the Lord Jesus, remembering your sacrifice that brings light to overcome the world's darkness. Lord, we look to, to your incarnate birthday as ordinary people and look forward to celebrating with joy and gladness an extraordinary king. Lord, I pray our voice is not to be muted as Zechariah was in his doubt, but have everlasting faith in God's word and promise of life everlasting. So be with us, Lord, as we, as we lift our voices to the heavens. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. And greet a neighbor. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, chapter 11, verse 19, and chapter 12, um, verses 1. Is it just 10 you wanted me to read? Okay. <laughs> then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a hailstorm. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate that. And we're glad you were here today. Welcome you this Sunday. And uh, it's good to see uh, so many here today. We're, we're just thankful you're in the Lord's house. Uh, good to see Bob Johnson and uh, Gwen back. And we're thankful uh, they are doing much better. And uh, we praise the Lord for that. So, uh, Make sure you uh, let them know we're glad they're here. Uh, we're, we're glad that you are here, and I'm looking forward to this service today. We remind you we'll be ending the hour in communion. And, uh, and of course, last Sunday we had our uh, church's business meeting and conducted, and uh, uh, things were voted on accordingly, and, and on we go into 2023 pretty quickly. So uh, we pray that God will bless that in a, in a special way. Uh, we want to uh, just uh, take a few uh, minutes and talk about our prayer needs. Uh, remember Don Griffin in your prayer. Don was taken to uh, Marion General Hospital this morning, uh, possibly a stroke, we're not sure. But anyway, they were uh, uh, looking at him with that in mind. So you pray that God would bless Don, and Dottie is there with him, and, and just pray that that will be... Uh, uh, not the case and that it's something uh, less uh, urgent than that. So pray, pray for Don in Marion General Hospital. Then remember Mayanna King. She's uh, a little one uh, that's uh, been on our, our minds as far as prayers go, and we ask you to continue to pray for this little child. Uh, she uh, uh, has some very serious health issues and needs, needs our prayers and our support at this time. Also, Jeff Hubsman uh, is a, a pastor and uh, dealing with cancer, and uh, certainly I know he would appreciate your prayers. And then the list goes on, and as we're thankful, some here are, uh, uh, like Bob Johnson today, doing much better, and we praise the Lord for that and uh, pray for all of these that are on the list. Are there any other names that we should add that's not on the list? Tim? Okay, all right, we'll remember. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, okay, all right. Remember her in, your, in our prayers. Anyone else? All right, okay. We're going to sing our prayer course today, and as we do every week here, his name is wonderful. We'll sing it through twice. Second time, you're invited to 
lift your hand up and we will uh, uh, remember special prayer needs. Perhaps we can't bring before the, the whole church body but that you would like to have prayed for. And certainly as those are listening today on Facebook, we invite you uh, to do the, uh, the same and raise your hands and we'll remember those needs as we go to the Lord in prayer. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master. Let's go back and sing that again. His name. Yeah, let's go back on that. Well, okay. All right. I'll tell you what. We're just going to sing He's the Great Shepherd, and we'll hold our hands up on that. I forgot there's another part of this. Okay. He's the Great, he's the great Shepherd. We'll start there. You know, right there. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, he's the Great Shepherd. The rock of all ages, almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus. was a long course, I know. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these gathered here, a good number, and we pray, Lord, you bless accordingly today those who have made the effort to come to God's house. Thank you, Lord, and might there be a, a double blessing for each one who's here today. Lord, we pray for those who cannot be here that you might lift them up and, and hold them up, we pray, Lord. Uh, many hands raised, and we know, Lord, many prayer needs, so we ask today that those needs will be met, uh, both here in this room and around the community for others who, in our prayer time, just, just wanted to make sure, Lord, that, that you heard their prayer. We ask, Lord, for your well-being in our numbers. We're thankful for this good crowd today, and we just pray, Lord, as we approach a very wonderful season of the year that our hearts are right before you, that we love you and praise and we adore you. And so we ask, Lord, today you'll lead us, you'll guide us, and that this service will be done for your honor and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Uh, today, let me remind you of announcements. Uh, we'll not take a long time to do that. We put in your uh, I think some of the bulletins have them, maybe all of them did, but anyway, it says my offering. Uh, during the month of December, we collect uh, uh, for uh, ministers and missionaries, and it's a uh, time to just uh, uh, celebrate those who serve the Lord, and we are thankful. And so anyway, hope uh, you can make a, a special donation. We'll, uh, the offering received Christmas Eve that night will go especially uh, for this cause, but there are envelopes out there if you desire to put them in uh, today. So I'll remind you of that. Uh, also, we want to remind the uh, church council we're meeting. Uh, it is on the 12th uh, instead of the 14th. That's tomorrow night, right? Yeah, so that's the 12th. Okay. So anyway, we're, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's probably my fault. So I'll take the blame for it. Anyway, you can come on the 14th, but you'll have your own private meeting, I imagine. So. Yeah, yeah, possibly, yes, that's choir night, so anyway. All right, so, uh, so anyway, uh, the 12th, the church council meeting at 6 p.m., uh, 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 we will remind you choir practice this Wednesday night, just uh, this Wednesday and then Saturday at, at 10 o'clock uh, will be uh, practice, and then next Sunday the choir will be performing cantata, the cantata, Beautiful Star, a lovely uh, 
uh, I think, uh, arrangement of music that just uh, will set you in the Christmas spirit. So I hope you'll be here next Sunday for that special day. Then the end of that week, Saturday evening, and we know uh, that's how things fall this year uh, uh, because of the Gregorian calendar, calendar. We'll blame it on that, okay? Anyway, the 24th Christmas Eve, Saturday night. So we will have services here at 6 p.m. We hope to have a house full. And uh, please invite your friends and family. We, uh, we will have a good time together. Everyone that comes uh, receives a flashlight and... Uh, anyway with uh, our name on it and uh, it you can let your light shine in the middle of the night with this so anyway uh, we hope you'll come and and, uh, and and walk away with something that just reminds you that we love you and we're thankful for your love for us um, so uh, please take note of that and then on 25th we will have services we will not have Sunday school that day just the uh, uh, morning worship service and it will be a little condensed that day. But we hope that you'll come and be with us for our uh, Christmas Day service on the 25th. And so uh, other uh, activities, choir and Sunday school are mentioned there uh, on our uh, notes. And so uh, please make note of that. And uh, hope and pray you'll be with us for a very, very special time. Uh, uh, let me also remind you today is Communion Sunday. So we do have the diaconate. Uh, offering plate on the left side of the door and on the right side is our church uh, our church offering and uh, so again thank you for your faithfulness in that and uh, uh, Jeff put up real quick our food pantry again thanks for those who are helping to support us in that uh, very great offering we appreciate uh, we appreciate your giving for that we uh, we want to stand and we're going to sing the doxology, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. So please stand with us as we sing the doxology and thank the Lord for the offering this day. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. today it is a rejoicing that we are here with you and that you are here with us and so lord today we we together thank you for saving our souls for lifting us above the miry clay at, of sin and to putting and putting our feet on the solid rock christ jesus so lord today bless us as we do our best to serve you Thank you for those who have brought offerings and those who cannot, Lord, bless them, we pray. And uh, we're just thankful again for all that you do for us, for your life that you've given us, and for grace that sustains us, and for love that carries us on. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We want you to sing with us, He Lives. Now, I really believe this is a rejoicing song, so rejoice as you sing. He lives.
give a great hallelujah because he does live in my heart. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Ruth Ella, and thank each of you again for singing and just uh, what, a, what a great song to rejoice in and, and that we can testify that he lives. Well, I wanted to uh, say thank you to uh, Pam Gruber and a little bit to Al. I understand. <laughs> Pam uh, had uh, had our ladies at her house last night as a Christmas gathering, and and I think uh, reestablishing our women's group that uh, that I think is going to uh, be a, a great success, and and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I think counting Pam, 18 were there last night, so that is a was great, good crowd, and uh, thank you, ladies, for for coming and. And I think if I uh, understand right, they are going to try to start meeting on Saturday mornings the same time our men are meeting, uh, but it will be at a different place. So men, just take it easy, don't, don't, don't worry. So we're gonna uh, meet at the church in Dirty Hall, and uh, so uh, nice and uh, easy for everyone to get in, and that way there aren't any late nights for you. So uh, that'll be the fourth, Saturday of the month at t at uh, 10 a.m. at 10 a.m. So, ladies, hope you can come and and uh, we'll get the meeting started again and and uh, appreciate all over the years those who uh, supported it and and uh, I'm just glad to see that going and that'll be uh, I know very beneficial for the church and beneficial for you to come and and uh, support it. So uh, a little more we'll be told about it as we get that going in the month of January, but. Anyway, uh, I, I'm excited that, uh, that that's reestablished. Well, today, the message from the Word of God, the war in heaven. Very interesting passage of Scripture. Uh, maybe some thought I never knew there was a war in heaven. Well, Revelation 11:19 really connected to chapter 12 and really into chapter 13 all the way down to verses 18 uh, talks about that war that took place in heaven. I want to remind you just of a few things to start to kind of refresh your memories as we continue on in this study that I think is, is very applicable, very, uh, very good in this time and age in which we live. Uh, I, remind, I remind you that seven is the key number to the book of Revelation. Seven unlocks a lot of the keys that we find here. And to put that into perspective, it is God who in his perfection, the triune, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then his, his creation of earth uh, brings the number four into bear, which is man, and that gives perfection. God loves us and came to do special things with us, and that connection ties us together with him. And so just after the seven trumpets has sounded, we are given the vision of an open temple. And Laura read for you, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. And it, under, it underscores the fact that when God is present, the world responds. Things happen in a, in a very amazing way. And so as you look at this passage, the, I remind you that the history of the world is a history of wars and conflict. And just as you go back into the book of Genesis and read through to the book of Revelation, there is the, the record of the never-ending struggle that, that takes place between good and evil. There's always that warring that goes on. 
as God does his design in this world and Satan does his best to disrupt the will of God. So as we come to this passage, there is a, a mighty and, and real triumph for God and for us as his people. We're coming now to the close of the tribulation and, and approaching the millennium. And if the word millennium uh, bothers you or you're not quite uh, familiar with it, I might call it the kingdom age. And for a thousand years, Christ will rule and reign here on this earth. There will be peace as there has never been peace on this earth. And as you find this last part of the book of tribulation revealed, there are 1260 days, three and a half years. That's the second half of the tribulation period. And this is called, by the way, the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, in the, in the studies of chapters 12 and 13, some interesting things for us to, to see and, and observe here. Uh, I want you just to follow with me and, and we will again make a, a, a fast hurried dash, I guess is the best way to describe what I have to do, to try to share some things with you and, and uh, be in the book long enough for us to understand, but, but I, I, uh, I don't want to... Uh, uh, to overburden you, I guess, by, by, uh, by staying in, in one place too long. So let me share with you today the vision of the open temple. And in verse 19 there, as, it, as, it, as I said, transitions into the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, we have the temple opened up. It reveals to us something about who God is. Uh, the ark is that symbol of the presence of God himself. Do you remember in the Old Testament as the children of Israel were making their way out of Egypt and God instructed them to do certain things? One of them was to build the Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark was the presence of God. The, the, uh, 12, uh, the commandments were put in there to, uh, to where God had etched on stone his written word that he'd given to Moses, and that was carried by the priests as they would transition from one place to another as they moved and, and got a little closer to the promised land. And so that ark is that symbol of God's presence. It reminds us that he desires to be with us. And if you think about it as that ark was carried uh, by, by those men who had consecrated and dedicated themselves to God, it was also the realization that God was in the midst of his people. And I think we should understand God wants to be here. In, in the New Testament, there's a scripture that says, where two or three are gathered together, there I will be with you. And it's the reminder that God's presence abides in us, that we have that connection. And so God is now taking up interest on those on the earth that have become his people. And, and just as the ark in the Old Testament was a sign of his presence, so it is here. And so as we come to chapter 12, and again, I've got a lot of scripture to cover and we're going to have communion at the end. So I promise you I won't, uh, I won't tarry long in all of this. But in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter, it says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven. Now these sights are seen by John as he is standing there in amazement at God's revelation. And I, and I remind you, not revelations. There's one revelation from God. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and, and pain to be delivered. And then it says there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And so we're going to talk about that for just a little bit here and remind you what God is sharing with us in, in, his, uh, in John's vision as he sees the future unfold. And so that, that woman with child. Now, let me start by saying this. There are three personages of interest here, three people. The woman, the child, and the dragon. Um, 
when I asked Brenda if she would have something ready for this Sunday, she said, what would you like me to sing about? I said, do you have any songs about red dragons? <laughs> and she had a kind of stunned look on her face, so I don't think we'll be hearing that in a few minutes. So anyway, to, to kind of describe this to you, there, there is this sun-clothed woman, this woman that is radiated with the sun. Now, there are some who would argue about who this woman was. The Romanists want us to think it's the Virgin Mary, while others who say, uh, no, it's the church, and still others say it's the professing church, and the man-child is, is a class of overcomers who escape the revelation. That's some ideas that circulate around. The Christian scientists say that she is the instrument of the devil, the deluded woman who is worshipped as a founder of a cult. But in this passage, as you study it, it becomes pretty clear who she is. This woman is Israel. There's no doubt about it. If you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 37 and verse 9, we, we read there in that passage of Scripture that, that, uh, that Israel is clothed in the light of God, clothed with the glory of the, of the sun. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2 tells us that. And then you go to the dream that Joseph has uh, as he talks about the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down uh, uh, to him. It again refers to Israel. It's that realization that they have a special place in the plan and the heart of God. In fact, this uh, typifies Joseph and slavery, but it's also a type of Israel in her place in the prophetic plan. So God wants us to know he's not done with Israel yet. He's still continuing on with Israel. That's why in Genesis 12 it says that, that we should love the nation of Israel and honor them. That's our job, our duty, our prerogative. That hasn't changed since Old Testament days. And we still should be very supportive of who Israel is and what Israel is doing. And, and I, I, I hope we know and we understand that God works in his way in dealing with us in a, in a, uh, a very orderly manner but he does not forget his own. Might we never, ever forget that? When I look at this, I, I, I think in the book of Revelation, let me share this with you, a little side note. There are four different women in the book of Revelation that are revealed. Uh, one in chapter 2 and verse 20 is Jezebel. And we remember who Je Jezebel was. She was the high priest of paganism. She worshipped all the other gods but the one true God. And Jezebel did her best to destroy the testimony and the life of the prophet Ezekiel, but she could not do it. And that high priest is, is mentioned in chapter 2 and verse 20. There is a second woman mentioned in chapter 17 of Revelation. She is the scarlet woman, and that's the high priestess of apostasy. I think we understand, and it doesn't take a lot of insight for us to see that this world is very much away from the things of God. As we listen, as we hear, as we, as we read about things in, this, in these last days, all the world turns against who God is and what Jesus is. The, the, the truth of Jesus as we approach the very special season of, of Christmas, is dismissed by the world. It's cast aside. Now, I, I too enjoy Christmas so, so very much. But let me tell you, uh, it's not wrong to celebrate with children and, and enjoy the, the, the season of ho, 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 you know. But the season is about Jesus Christ, isn't that right? That's who it's about. And we must never forget that Jesus is the center. He is the reason for the season, as someone said. And so don't ever throw that aside or dismiss that. Christ should be in the center of your Christmas this year, I hope and pray. And so this, this scarlet woman of apostasy, you find her described in chapter 17 of, of Revelation, you're going to find is a woman that does her best to lead the world away. 
And that's where the world is currently, just walking away from the things of God. And then the fourth woman that's found here in Revelation 12 is Israel. And it's a reminder that God is not finished with Israel. He's still dealing with it. And I hope we know and we understand that. His purpose will be seen, clearly seen, as at the consummation of this world when the end of the millennium happens. After a thousand years of perfection, and we enter into the beginning uh, stages of eternity. God will unify Israel and the church. It will become one again. And, and so we're thankful that that day and time is coming. But until that day comes, there are some things that are happening all around us. Uh, in, in chapter 12, in verses 3 and 4, there is the truth of the great red dragon. And I know you've been waited with bated breath to hear about this red dragon, right? It says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Uh, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, and the dragon, uh, as he stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, uh, maybe some of you already have Im imagery there of, of what this is talking about, but the description here uh, talks about this dragon who appears in heaven. And it's an understanding that it is a, a picture, an emblem of Satan himself. And the seven horns symbolize the power of the God of this world. Satan is a strong individual. Do not be fooled into thinking that he is a weakened, whipped puppy. He still has, he's still the prince and power of the air. And when you read about Satan and in and, and him, he, you find he was the anointed one in heaven. He had a very special place in heaven going back into the Old Testament and in Ezekiel chapter 25. And it says, an angel that covereth. And it, it, he had a duty of honoring God and giving to God glory, but we know he threw that away. We know he is the God of this world system in Ezekiel, or 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. And so he very much moves and manipulates and divides and tries to tear apart the things of God. In Ephesians 2 verse 2, he is called the prince of the power of the air. There is strength within him to do things. He is also in John 12 31 called the prince of this world. And it's a reminder that he's strong, that he's powerful, that he's working to disrupt the things of God. And it says in this passage, which I find very intriguing, and, and as I read it, 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 very easy to understand what it's talking about, but, I, but I'll, I'll mention it just to make sure we know. His tail of this dragon, as he swings it around in heaven, draws one-third of the angels. Do you remember when Satan was cast out of heaven in the Old Testament, when he rose up against God and wanted to believe that he was supreme to who God is and what God is? He was thrown out of heaven. But before he left heaven, he had convinced one-third of the angels that he should be in charge. And so we read of a third of the, of the angels falling from heaven and this verse 4 of Revelation 12 is talking about that third of the angels that fell from heaven who become the demonic spirits, the demonic demons who follow Satan and work for Satan in this current age and time. And, and just remember that, that Satan is very much uh, alive. He is working. He is doing his best to, to disrupt the things of God. And so as we, as we come through this and we, we remember one very particular thing about the Old Testament, and, and, and I hope you'll hang on to this. When the children of Israel left Egypt and they began their march towards the promised land, there was doubt, there was confusion, there, there were those who did not fully understand God was in control. 
But God protected his children. And that 40-year protection in the wilderness as they walked with Moses is a reminder that God takes care of us even when we're not on the path that we should be. And, and so that to me is a wonderful thought. Even as believers, when we tend to struggle or we tend to wander a little to the left or a little to the right and we lose our place in and purpose in the things of God, God still has a hold of us. He's still using us and working with us and he'll get us back on track as we need to be. And for 40 years, those Israelites wandered through the wilderness. It was punishment. It was a judgment. They could have been in the promised land sooner, but it's a reminder that God controls and works with us in a great and mighty way. There's a fable that told a story about three apprentice devils who were coming to this earth to finish their apprenticeship. And they were talking to Satan, the chief of the devils, about their plans to tempt and uh, ruin men. And the first said, I will tell them, I will tell them there is no God. And Satan said, that will not delude very many, for they know that there is a God. The second said, I will tell man that there is no hell. And Satan said, you'll deceive no one that way. Many know that, that there is a hell for sin. There is punishment for wrong. And the third one said, I will tell men there is no hurry. And Satan said, go, and you will ruin them by the thousands. Isn't that the problem with the world today? A world that thinks there is no hurry, there is no necessity of making things right with Christ. I can put this off and do this at a later time. Certainly he has in a great way misled many to just think, not today. I don't need to do this until later. And so we know Satan works. And we understand that, that in all of this time, in this dealing that's going on, in this, in this war, that God is working and his way is still being accomplished. Now, time is not going to allow me to read the remainder of the scriptures, but in chapter 12, in verses 7 down through 17, there is the war and Satan is cast out. By the way, in this passage, Michael, uh, the archangel is, archangel rather, is, is introduced. Not as a stranger, uh, as, as it's seen back in the book of Daniel, but, but as an angelic prince. And we know that Michael very much plays a part in what is happening. When Jesus comes again, there will be a trumpet sound, and it is Michael who blows the trumpet. And he will call forth the dead at the return of Jesus. And so there's some things here that I want you to get note of. And, and, and again, go back home and read these, uh, these chapters, uh, uh, starting there in 1119 and down through chapter 13. And I think you'll, you'll say, oh, oh yeah, I get it. I understand that. So as, as, as the, uh, Satan is cast out, uh, I want you to think where he was cast out from. Very important. He was first cast out from the third heaven. That's God's abode. Paul said he was caught up to the third heaven and, and uh, had uh, uh, the vision that he spoke of. John talks about the third heaven. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 14 talks about that. So Satan is first of all kicked out of, out of heaven. And secondly, he's kicked out of the first and second heaven. And that's uh, in Revelation 12, verse 9. And that's the air around us and the stars above us. He's limited to where he's allowed to work. And the third place that he is cast into is the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, where he will be contained and chained uh, forevermore. And, and as all of this is happening here, God notes that there is a singing of praise that goes on. Heaven is singing with praise because there is power to overcome the accuser is given to those who are on earth. Now, you know, sometimes you feel like it's not fair, like it's not, things aren't right, that it's not where it should be. And I want you to remind you as 
I want to remind you as, as, as this world goes on and, and evil moves on and sometimes it seems that we can't elude those things that are caused by Satan that God still sits on the throne. I think I've said that every week and I want to continue to say it to remind you that of that. Now we, we come to this singing of praise and this power given to those who are on the earth, those who are living through the tribulation, who are coming to the end of the tribulation, and they are standing there thinking, this, this, this is a great battle. This is a hard one. Are we going to win? And the rejoicing begins because Satan is cast out. Now, what Satan do in this, in this interim time here? And I want you to, to get a hold of this because that's what happens in this last part of the tribulation. He pursues the woman. And remember, the woman, I believe, is Israel in that picture of his uh, trying destruction of Israel. By the way, if you do not see that in current news, current history, um, uh, of, what, of how people hate the nation Israel, try to destroy the nation Israel, you're missing a whole lot. Israel is still in God's hands. And I'm glad to know that he's in charge and he's in control and Israel's going to come out on top. Now, now he realizes, Satan realizes his time is short and he turns his fury upon the woman. And, and it, it, it's very descriptive in this passage. It says she's given two wings of the great eagle to fly to the wilderness. She gets away from Satan as he tries to put the stranglehold on her. And remember this, time is short, three and a half years we're talking about, God protects her. Very interesting thing, as I come to this passage of scripture and, and read this, it talks about water being one of the elements that is used to try to, to ruin the nation Israel. Now the reason that's very interesting to me is because of what we hear in the global world in which we live of, of the uh, South uh, uh, Antarctica and a great shelf of ice is, has broke off or is in a, pre, a place of breaking off at least and it will cause perhaps a five foot increase in water around all the coastal communities of the world. It's right here in the word of God. Did you know that? Right here, water comes to try to ruin the nation Israel. And, and in, in the reminder of this, God's in control. God's working things out. Don't be worried about it. Don't get scared about it. I don't know if you should buy waterfront property right now, but that's up to you, I guess. But, but I do see that God uses the elements to, to bring forth his plan. And some false teachings actually projected Israel would be carried away and be destroyed and be ruined. And I, I see as Satan tries to attack Israel, he finally turns his attention. It, it, and it's kind of like if you've ever seen a wild animal and how they attack. If they go after something and they're not winning right then, they'll turn their attention to something else. And that's what the great red dragon does here. Seeing defeat, he turns to the remnant. That's the believers. That's those who have trusted in Christ who are alive throughout the earth. And those saved saints resist Satan, but they do it by the blood of the lamb. Listen to verse 11. I want to read this out of chapter 12. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. I didn't say that they weren't killed. Didn't say that they didn't go to heaven, but Satan could not touch their souls. They belonged to the Lord. And I want you to remember this. No matter what happens in this world, no matter how bad things get, God has you. When he saved you and covered you with the blood of the lamb, you are protected in his hand until that day he takes you home. Now, very, very interesting thing. And 
And uh, I can't believe that I'm actually on time here. We're doing okay. There are two beasts mentioned down in Revelation chapter 13. And again, please, I, I really encourage you, go home and read this. Uh, eat your lunch and then just sit down and read for a little bit. In verses 1 through 18, we, we find satanic powers here. And they're operating on a global scale on the earth. And during the last half of the tribulation, that's the 42 months, the 1260 days that's mentioned, those forces, by the way, are now at work directing their energy. They're trying to kill the faithful remnant of the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, they're, they're trying to destroy them and keep them from living in the tribulation. They are called the beasts. The first beast is found in chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, and it talks about him coming out of the sea. And, and, and again, I don't want to get into a lot of crazy interpretations here. I just want to keep this as simplistic as, as we can, and I think that's always the best place to, to run to in, in, uh, in passages of, of Scripture that, that deal with, with things that are a little hard to understand. And, and just very simply put, the beast is the Antichrist. And if you go back to the book of Daniel, you'll see that uh, Daniel saw uh, in, in that vision of the, of the giant that falls, that is defeated, there is the, the body of the Babylon, Babylon the Medo-Persia, the, the Greco-Macedonian Empire, and they're pictured under the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And then you think of the old Roman Empire, you put them all together, and that becomes the first part of the last of the tribulation. So to understand what's going on here, it's the ten horns are ten empires that are existing that, that form the uh, government during the tribulation period. Now, politics is always... Well, let's just use the word interesting. <laughs> Would you agree with that? It, it, it's, it, it makes us angry. It makes us mad. It makes us sad. Once in a while, it even makes us vote. Huh? And it's a reminder that politics are, is at work. And so here's the politics of, the, of, of Revelation. This political leader who, who has a dominating, domineering power is giving Satan control. And... When Louis the the Fourteenth made this statement uh, a lot of years ago, he made this statement very uh, uh, very applicable to this. He said, "I am the empire," and he was referring to who he was and what he was, and that there was no empire without Louis the Fourteenth. Well, that's kind of that political. Uh, uh, foray that we see being described here in the book of Revelation and the reminder that Satan is, is moving things in a way for, for the climax that is coming here in the tribulation. And that's the first beast. It's a political beast. In the, the second beast, in chapter 13, verses 11 through 18, we find the false prophet is revealed. There is one who, who tells things and, and folks, if I can say it in a common vernacular, it just ain't so. You know, that's what he does. The first beast out of the sea, this one's out of the land. The first had ten horns. This one has only two horns. And uh, as we look at the political power, the structure of nations joining together, this one is the power of religion. Uh, religion will be what unifies the last part of the tribulation. Not God religion, but religion. Religion's always been around. We know that. We understand that. But religion is misused. It's abused. And if you don't know the Christ who is the center of, our, of, the, of the universe, if you do not know him, religion becomes an ugly beast. And so as you look at this, the first and the second beast make a vow. And they mark what is called in Daniel the 70th week of Daniel. That's the week of tribulation. The first beast, the political beast, breaks the covenant. And then the second turns to the first and demands worship of him. 
That's why the, the policies of the world or political people of the world will follow Satan and the Antichrist. The second beast is that personal vision of the Antichrist. He has two horns, but he speaks like a dragon. It, it, it says in verse uh, 14, I behold, I behold, or beheld rather another beast coming up out of the earth. John sees this second monster coming up out of the earth. It's a beast that looks like a lamb, but has a voice like a dragon. That's the deception of Satan. That's the destruction of this uh, Antichrist who will be arising here in the latter part of the tribulation. In John chapter 5 and verse 43, and uh, I don't know how many of you are jotting some of this down, but... but uh, it's amazing on Facebook. It'll be there when you go back and you can, you can jot it down then if you want to listen again. In John chapter 5 and verse 43, Jesus speaks about the Antichrist. And he speaks about uh, the fact that there is an idol and, and how he marks people in this period of time. And there is what is called the mark of the beast. In fact, it is such a mark, it is such a descriptive way to, to mark people that you cannot buy or sell, you cannot worship, you cannot do anything without this mark of the beast, either in the hand or in the forehead. And it says that the number of martyrs at this time, those who die for the cause of Christ, will be very great. I must say, Thanks be to God for his innumerable grace, for his love, for his mercy. And even when things are as bad and as ugly as it can be, we understand God's will still is accomplished. And as you look at this grace that saves his children from this awful hour, there's a number that arises that I want to close with that you should know if you do not know. It is the number 666. Six, six. And it goes all the way back to when Adam and Eve sinned. If you remember when God punished Adam and Eve for not believing him, and he said, all of the fruit of the uh, Garden of Eden you can, you can have, but leave this fruit alone. And, and Eve convinced Adam to partake of that fruit. And so God put a mark on mankind, and it says, six days thou shalt labor. It's that judgment of work, of, of living under the thumb of oppression. It's that reminder that we must labor to live in this world. And when you think of that number six times six, or 666, six, six, it's that multiplication of that original charge that God put upon men who had sinned as a reminder that we are punished without the blood of Jesus Christ. And the time that is given here is, is the, as we might call it, evil to the nth degree. It's so great, it's so large, it looms so massively that no one can walk or talk or do without having this mark. And so when we see all of this, we're reminded, uh, whether it's a stamp or whether it is a sign impressed on our lives, some have talked about barcodes, and there are so many different ways that people could be, could be marked in this day and time that we know. We know that all who subscribe to that will have it. Those who subscribe to Jesus Christ will not. And a mark that is there uh, marks us to, or marks this people to, to remind them that they do not belong to God. Be careful, might I say today, about how you mark yourself or making marks because we are not marked with a mark. We are marked by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that cleans, cleanses us from sin. And I hope today a lot of stuff that I've shared with you and uh, I, I hope maybe for a few of us our mind kind of went, you know, as you try to take it all in. There's a lot to hear, a lot to receive here. 
But in knowing that, know this, God's <laughs> going to take his church home when the time is right. Uh, would you come and sing for us, Brenda, please? We'll ask our diaconate, if they would, to make their way forward as we prepare for communion. In the book of Psalm 112, there scripture says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord and delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house and his righteousness 
endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious with discretion and full of compassion and righteousness. When we think of who God is and what he has done for us, we rejoice that our lives count for him. We come to a time called communion, a time where we encourage everyone who knows Jesus Christ as Savior to participate in this time of communion. We offer the bread and the cup to remember the life of Jesus and his death, his giving of his life, the most precious uh, thing that one can give, the entity of life that we know that he gave for you and for me. And so as we've talked today about those things, we rejoice in communion that his life counts, makes all the difference in the world, the perfect one who died for us, the imperfect. And today as we hold the, the bread, uh, we, we will ask you in, in a little while to, uh, in prayer, uh, we'll have a word of prayer and then partake of it. And if you're home today and you're listening and you would like to get a little piece of a cracker and a little a bit of juice, certainly you're welcome to celebrate with us this most important time. We remember that Jesus paid it all. And so I hope today as we take the bread, we know it represents his life. When we take the blood, it represents his life given for you and for me. We're going to ask the diaconate to pass it out to all. Uh, please hold it until all have received. We'll have a prayer and Brother Ray will lead us in prayer, and it's so good to see him uh, walking and, uh, and participating again and very quickly after his, uh, after his hip replacement. And so uh, thank, thank, uh, thank God that he is doing, doing so much better. Diaconate. <laughs>
seated. Let's bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful opportunity to come into your house and take part in communion. And Father, no greater gift could be given than what you did for us so that you might live, giving your only son, your only begotten son, that we can have everlasting life. Father, we just praise you and glorify you. Amen. Amen. Please take and eat. Again, we ask all of you to hold the cup until all have received, and we'll have a prayer and then receive together. The Ekman.
please be seated. As we're here on this Sunday and we celebrate communion, we remember Jesus. We remember his life. We think of his birth as we celebrate this joyous time, but we remember he came for a reason, to be our ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for these who are gathered in this room, for those who are listening, even now and joining in communion with us. And Lord, we pray that as we take this drink, might we know it represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us the great, great cause of our sin and reminds us of the solution that is in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for this day, for this rejoicing that we have, and we partake of this day and this cup in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take and drink. <coughs> Places in the pews there for you to place them. Um, please continue to pray for Hazel. As you know, she's had, uh, had some difficulties walking. She's home today and uh, unable to be here. But uh, again, uh, our diaconate offering as we try our best to uh, give that to those who... Uh, or share with those, I should say, who are in need. So we're thankful for your faithfulness in that matter. And again, the diaconate plate is on the left side of the door, offering for the church on the right side. And uh, thank you for being here today. Hope you rejoice in things of God. Remind council tomorrow night, we'll be meeting at 6 p.m. in uh, Durchie Hall. And for uh, a choir, Wednesday night at uh, 6 p.m., and then uh, again on Saturday at 10 a.m. And then next Sunday, the choir will be presenting the cantata. And I know you'll want to come and hear it. They'll, they'll bless your heart. Let's all stand. We're going to de be dismissed in a word of prayer. And again, thank you for your presence, for your goodness, for your love, for your support. And uh, I know God is doing great things. A good number here today, and we're thankful for each one is here. Brother Bob Johnson, do you feel strong enough to pray for us, sir? Amen. Sure.